Well, we've gone back to Sunday school this summer. And uh, we've been revisiting all those children's lessons that uh, we may have heard if we grew up in, in a church um, when we were young. And we have come to those stories and revisited them as adults. From creation to Noah to Joseph and his coat, David and Goliath and some others. And now this morning we end and we come to Jonah and the whale. Let's get right to it. Read Jonah. And there is no whale. It says Jonah was swallowed by a, a huge or a great fish. But it doesn't say whale. Now most people don't know this because they've never actually read the words of the book of Jonah. They've just taken it from somebody else. It became a whale as people wondered, well, what type of fish could hold a human body? Which is an issue in itself. But that Jonah gets swallowed by a big fish really is, it's not even the crucial point of the book of Jonah. Um, if it wasn't included in the story, the message of Jonah would still stand. Maybe the most important part of the book of Jonah is actually a plant, a plant that grows, and we'll get to that later. The story of Jonah is about running from what God wants us to do. It's about not being able to stop the purposes of God. It's about getting angry with God when God doesn't do things our way. And it's about God's massive compassion for the world and all people. Jonah was a prophet of the Lord, and he was called by God to go to the great city of Nineveh to preach against it because of its wickedness. Uh, Nineveh is, uh, was in what we know today as modern-day Iraq. It was located in, in what was known as Assyria, on the eastern banks of the Tigris River. Nineveh was one of the great ancient cities of Mesopotamia. It was really the most glorious city of its day in terms of its physical beauty and cultural prestige. Kind of like Pleasant Grove. And uh, the Assyrians, well, they'd been absolutely terrible, brutal to the Israelites, so their hatred for Nineveh was great. The Ninevites were not a pleasant people. They were known for their violence. They were known for their terrorism. And Jonah was to go and to be a missionary to, and an evangelist to these people. The Bible scholar James Lindbergh describes it this way. It would be as if a Jew who had lost family in the Holocaust, were asked to undertake a mission to Germany just after the Nazi period. Now knowing this, Jonah tells God, well, no, thank you. And he runs away. He books a ticket on a cruise ship to Tarshish, which goes in the opposite direction of Nineveh. He tries to escape. But there's no running from the Lord. And a great storm overcomes the ship, and Jonah believes that the storm has come because the Lord knows he is on the ship, and his conscience gets the best of him, and he tells the crow to throw him into the sea, and that will appease the Lord and bring a storm to the halt. And that's when the great fish comes and swallows Jonah. And Jonah spends three days, three nights in this great fish before he is spit out. And that's really all of about two verses, and that's it. Now Jesus refers to Jonah as we heard in that reading from Matthew. Jesus is being tested by the religious leaders. They say they want to see a sign. They want to see proof that he is from God. And he says the only sign, the only proof that they are going to get, that generation is going to get, is what he calls the sign of Jonah. And he says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And Jesus is referring to his death and his resurrection. But he doesn't expound on this. He does tell them that, um, that the Ninevites repented and that this generation won't be as good as them if they don't turn to God. But back to the book of Jonah. He is spit out of this great fish, and then we read this. 
the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Jonah, after trying to run from what God told him to do, gets a second chance. Has God ever given you a second chance? Well, this time Jonah obeys, and he goes to Nineveh. You know, sometimes maybe we need to be swallowed up, spend some time in a dark and messy place and vomit it out before we realize, you know, it's just easier to go the Lord's way than try to run from him. Well, Jonah preaches to the city of Nineveh that if they don't change their wicked ways, in 40 days the Lord is going to overthrow that city. And lo and behold, the Ninevites respond to this message and they believe God. And the king of Nineveh issues a proclamation that all the people, even down to the animals, are not to eat, they are not to drink, they should wear sackcloth as a sign of their sorrow and repentance, and that everyone should urgently call on God, give up their evil ways and their violence in hopes that God will change his mind and that he'll have compassion uh, and not bring about this terrible destruction on Nineveh. And the whole place repents. Nineveh changes. If you are a prophet, if you are a preacher, you couldn't ask for a better response than this. And it says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. You would think Jonah is overjoyed. Wow. God, this is, this is great. People are turning to you. They're changing. Your message has been heard. But no. Jonah gets angry. He cannot believe the Lord is going to let them off the hook. And, and, and he goes ballistic over God having compassion on them. And now we're getting to the meaning of the book of Jonah and the story of Jonah. Jonah has an absolute conniption. He yells at God. And the sense of the Hebrew words is like this. It's like it says, it was evil to Jonah, a great evil, and his anger burned. The it of Jonah's anger is the heart of the matter. Jonah says, he knew this was going to happen. He knew it, and that's why he ran off to Tarshish. He knew God was a God of grace and mercy, that God is not easily angered, that he's rich in love, is ready at the drop of a hand to turn plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. Jonah is angry that God's grace has been extended to the Assyrians, and he thinks God is too soft on sinners, because if they are in on the love of God, then Jonah wants out. Every one of us have a they or a them. They are the ones we don't like. They are the ones we want to see get theirs. They are the people who have hurt us or wronged us or made our lives miserable and keep us awake at night. And if they showed up in church and sat next to us, we would not like it. Do you see what's happening? Do you see Jonah's lack of compassion and his self-absorbed attitude? And the irony of Jonah's meltdown is that he knows exactly what God is like, that God is gracious, that God is compassionate, he's slow to anger, he's abounding in steadfast love. He knows his Bible because those very words come from the Bible. They're found in Exodus. They're found several places in the Old Testament to describe God. It was kind of a creed that every believer in God knew and it was used over many centuries. It is biblical. It is true. It is one of the best and soundest descriptions of the heart and the very nature of God that we find in the whole Bible. Jonah knows how the Lord is. And his cloak is now all up in a wad because he's better at judgment than he is at mercy. And the Lord asks Jonah now. He says, not Jonah. Have you any right to be angry? And Jonah gives the Lord the silent treatment. 
He doesn't respond. I'm not going to answer. How many of us like to give the silent treatment when we're, when we're mad? I want to welcome all the passive aggressives to church this morning. Glad we're all here. Hello. <laughs> Jonah goes outside the city, pouting, and he makes himself some shade because it can be hot in that part of the world. And he waits to see now what this gracious, compassionate God is going to do to Nineveh. And then the Lord does something very kind for Jonah. And he provides a plant with huge leaves, shade leaves, and, and he makes it grow and it, and it gives Jonah shade from this brutal Middle East heat. Jonah loves this. Life is looking up. But the next day, the Lord sends a worm to devour the plant so that it withers. And then the Lord sends a scorching east wind, it says, and the sun beats down so strongly on Jonah that he begins to faint. Now Jonah says, I would just rather die. Again, the Lord challenges Jonah and asks him what right he has now to be angry about this plant withering. First he's angry about Nineveh, then not getting blasted, and now he's angry about the plant. And Jonah snips back, I have a right to be angry, and I am angry enough to die. Well, little does Jonah know he's walked right into it because the Lord is working with this angry, pouting, self-pitying prophet. And he definitely wants to teach him a lesson. And the Lord says, what's this, Jonah? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree which you did nothing to get by the way, you neither planted it, you didn't water it, it grew up in one night, it died the next day. So, why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't know right from wrong, not to mention the innocent animals. That's what God says. And that's the end of the story of Jonah. That's where it ends. When God asked Jonah, in, in the words that end the entire book, should I not be concerned about this great city? That word for concerned is a Hebrew expression that, talk, that, that describes tears coming from the eyes. It's like God is crying over Nineveh. He's so touched by how far they are from him. The Lord is trying to teach Jonah about godly compassion. This plant that he gave to Jonah is kind of a parable of God's grace. Jonah received abundant grace from the Lord. Think about it. The Lord didn't let him drown in the sea. He gave him a second chance after he disobeyed and tried to run away from his call the first time. He gave him shade from that brutal heat, even while Jonah was giving him the silent treatment and pouting all the way. But Jonah sure doesn't like seeing that grace being showed to someone he doesn't think deserves it, like the Ninevites. We want God to be gracious to us. We want God to forgive us. We want God to come to us, but not those other people. No way God's love should go to them. Us? Phil? <laughs> I deserve it. One commentator I read, he called this the Jonah Syndrome. Do you have the Jonah Syndrome? We're so angry with someone or some group of people that we're just sitting and pouting our life away, and we sure don't want them to have any part in God's love. Jonah resents the Lord showing mercy to Nineveh, even though Jonah has been the recipient of that mercy. Jonah thinks God's mercy should only be shown to people like himself. When it says God so loved the world that he gave his son, is that really something we believe? The world, all nations, all peoples, all individuals, that Jesus came and died and is for us all, that God grieves for those who are apart from him. Or are there people, yeah, we don't want to see them in church, at least not the church I go to, because they might find Christ and, and, and we might have to be, I don't know, family with them. But you know, God loves all people and he wants all people to turn to him and know him, including those that we have a problem with. 
the writer Anne Lamott, she said this. She said, you can tell, you can tell when you've made God in your own image when it turns out he hates all the same people you do. <laughs> And perhaps we Christians need God's mercy more than those who are far from God. You know, that's how it was with Jonah. And Jonah is angry at God for being God. God is gracious. He is compassionate. He is slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. Jonah, what's your problem? Remember what we call the parable of the prodigal son? parable of that lost son. Jesus told that parable because religious people were criticizing Jesus for getting a little too close to the wrong type of people, the sinners. And remember that elder brother in the parable? He is furious when the father welcomes back and is prodigal to this son with love and graciousness, this son who's run away and, and lived irresponsibly and blown all the inheritance. Remember what that father tells the older brother? The father tells that angry oldest son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. The Lord says, Jonah, we had to celebrate over Nineveh. They're found. You know, it was the deeply religious and spiritually serious people who had the hardest time with Jesus, and he had the hardest time with them. Jonah was pretty convinced that his enemies were also God's enemies, and when that didn't turn out to be the case, he became angry Maybe we get angry when our expectations are not met and we get angry when God doesn't act like we expect him to act, when he doesn't do what we think he should. And there may be people sitting and pouting and moping in anger because God hasn't done everything they think he should do in the way that he has done it. And it's interesting that the book of Jonah ends with a question, with God asking Jonah a question. Should I not be concerned about them? Shouldn't be God concerned about them so that they can have his grace and compassion too? You know, the book of Jonah is read in Jewish synagogues once a year in their services on the Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. The Jews read the entire book. They listen to this story. On this day, the Day of Atonement, Jews confess their sins against God and against their neighbor. It's a day to look at their own lives. It's a day to look at their own hearts, to look in the mirror. A day to remember that God will forgive if people turn back to him. The forgiveness we receive from God, it's a pure gift of grace. Jonah reminds us we don't own that grace. It's God's gift to give to whoever he wants to. God can forgive. God can be gracious. He can abound in steadfast love to whoever God wants to. And his mercy is often much wider than ours. Have we not seen this in our Lord Jesus Christ? John writes in 1 John, he said, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And so this story is much more about a guy and a whale. It's about how a gracious and loving God is way more gracious and loving than we humans can be. Well, did Jonah ever get out of his anger? Did the elder brother ever accept welcome and rejoice over the younger brother? Should God be concerned? I guess we will just have to answer that ourselves with our own lives, right? Let's pray. Lord, our God, we're thankful that you so love the world. Help us to be glad in your desire to save all. And remind us again of your great story that is made up of all these smaller stories in the Bible. 
For those of us who were raised in children's Sunday school, thank you for those who taught us. We ask all of us would have a mature faith, that we would have a deepened understanding of your story and of our part in it. For you are our God and we are your people. Amen.